Rudyard Kipling said the first condition of understanding a foreign country is to smell it. And I'm sure we can add the second condition is to taste it. After all, when we eat the food of other countries, we dine on their culture too. Today, in the last of our Writers' Banquet series, we travel to Spain, France, Italy, China and beyond to learn about their distinctive flavours. My three guides are very well known as travellers of taste, Stephanie Alexander, Frank Camora and Elizabeth Chong. Frank Camora is an award-winning chef of Catalan origin who operates operates the Movida restaurants and has appeared on MasterChef. His first cookbook titled Movida and co-written with Richard Cornish was awarded Best Cookery Book by a chef at the Australian Food Media Awards and Frank is an official ambassador for Amnesty International's 50th anniversary. Stephanie Alexander opened her first restaurant in, uh, in the 1960s and Stephanie's restaurant opened in 1976 and stayed open for 21 years. She is one of Australia's most highly regarded food writers. She'd written 11 books and her signature publication, The Cook's Companion, has established itself as the kitchen bible in many, many homes across Australia. And Elizabeth Chong is a chef, teacher, author and presenter. Since she opened her first cooking school in 1961, she's introduced her family's Chinese recipes to the Australian public. The First Happiness was her first cookbook. It was published in the 1980s. Her other books include The Heritage of Chinese Cooking and Tiny Delights. Please welcome my guests to the book show. Well, this is a, a program today about eating and travelling and tasting. So let's talk about travel for first. Stephanie, when was your first inkling that you wanted travel to be a big part of your life? Oh, I think like most Australian young people, I, you know, was when I was about 17 or 18, I was all my dreams and everything revolved around going to Europe, like almost everybody I knew. So I set out when I was 21, and to see the world, and that was the first of many trips. And, and I did see the, the world. world was well, most the world in my case most. was mostly yeah. France mm -hmm. and most and a bit of England. Yeah. What about you, Elizabeth? Well, I think Asia would have to be my uh, world to go and see. And I can remember way back in 1969, my father said to me, now, um, you really haven't seen much out of Melbourne, have you? And I think before you um, go much further, and, you know, I was raising small children at the time, just, I think, and he said, uh, I think it's a good time for you to see a little bit of, of Hong Kong. And um, I think that extended into Japan and the rest of Southeast Asia, and it really, really got me going. I just could not believe that such a world existed outside of Melbourne and that everybody looked like me. <laughs> that must that, have been that really astounded pleasant, me. lovely, uh, yeah. a shock. How did you feel about it? I that? just kept seeing me mirrored in people, and I kept seeing like sisters and, and, and friends. And I said, oh, "There's Irene, there's Wendy." There's, I mean, I just couldn't believe it, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, I didn't feel different. So that was quite a funny experience. What about you, Frank? <laughs> Um, well, actually, the first time I travelled overseas, um, I was 20 as well. And again, like the other guests, it was you know, just the aspiration of, of going to Europe. My background's Spanish, so that's sort of the first place I went to. And the reasons behind it weren't so much for, for the food at that stage. I was actually studying architecture. It was uh, 91, just before the Barcelona Olympics. So I went to Barcelona and, you know, really were, fell in love with the architecture and, you know, and Gaudi, and, and, but also realised that again a little bit like Elizabeth that you know I saw myself in this culture that you know I understood why at home my dad would you know be fascinated by a piece of ham and know what was good and bad about it and everyone else was you know fasc as fascinated as him in that same culture and and then I just realized well it's actually quite normal so he's not weird he's he's just you know sitting um, in a different place now but uh, I bet he was pleased then that you you came to that conclusion well you, well not really because I gave up the architecture to be 
didn't have a cook, so you can imagine it wasn't a really a pleasing decision for the parents. But pleasing that you, you found him not so strange after all. Yes, it's always nice for a parent yeah. to, to find their children feeling that way about them. This is going to be a conversation about food, but it's also about writing. And I wondered um, how the travel bug became uh, the writing bug in a sense, Stephanie. Well, I think I've always always loved words and always wanted to put um, describe what I was thinking and what I was seeing in words, even when I long before I wrote a book. So it was actually a fairly gentle progression into saying I really want to say why I'm doing certain things. So my first book was about it was 20 menus from the very early days of Stephanie's restaurant, and it was because in those days people really were very intrigued as to why restaurant chefs put certain things together and I felt that one of the things that I could do quite well was to describe why I did things and what was going on in my head and it inevitably had a lot of cultural links and and it had links with travel experiences as to why something was on a menu and, it, and uh, so it was just a way of explaining. What about you, Elizabeth? When when did when did the a little bit of what Stephanie says? I can uh, I can echo that as well. But even when I was a schoolgirl, I used to like to write in the school magazine and so forth. And then I opened my cooking school way back in 1961, and I found that it wasn't just cooking. One had to write. One had to write the recipes and why such and such a recipe was done that way and so my writing became as important as the as the actual cooking of it so it's not just actually writing a book as you said the first book I think was 1982 I was writing recipes you know and I think that that sort of spurred me on to uh, to thinking perhaps it's a little bit of an ego driven thing to to think that other people want to read what you have got to say I don't know maybe that's a, a, a little bit of a motivation there that you feel you've got something to offer and um, and that that kind of led to the first book but mind you I can remember traveling and I hadn't written a book and there's always a notepad on the table cheap little notepad and pen and I'd be scribbling or serviettes you know paper serviettes and writing recipes down there and then coming back and putting them into better words when you got Got back. And so I think that's the way it starts. Not, and I didn't deliberately set out to be an author. I just started to write and I just kept writing. And Frank, you've co-written your books um, with Richard Cornish. Um, tell me about you know, the move to, to writing. Um, it's sort of been an evolution. So like, you know, the start, you know, Richard, uh, as a journalist, you know, we'd, yeah, we'd begin by stating a, a subject it could be pimenton spanish paprika and i'd just blurt everything i could into a, on a piece of paper not worrying about grammar or spelling or whether things made sense we'd talk about it we'd evolve it and then slowly you know as you know my vegetable sticker came along I'd, I'd try to write a little bit more and the latest couple of books have written a, a food guide to barcelona where i've just written you know the the, the um all the text myself and you know for my bits and richard just come in and, and finish it off so I mean, you know, my skills obviously are more visual and, you know, and tactile. And, um, so, so it's just been something that I've learned to really enjoy doing by doing it and getting better at it as you, as you do with everything. Well, let's talk about the cookbooks now. Um, Stephanie, t tell us about your connection to the Dordogne Valley in southwest France, because in your book, uh, Cooking and Travelling in Southwest France, you've written that the entire region is a gastronomic paradise, and you describe the people as well as the geography. Um, tell, us, tell me about this gastronomic paradise and how, why, why this place, of all places, that you're connected to. I think uh, over the years I probably have crisscrossed France. There's very few parts of France that I haven't visited and, and spent some time in. But this deeply green part of France that was still very, very rural and uh, where it seemed to me that cultural traditions were hanging on perhaps longer than they were in some other parts where it was a very um, far, it was farming community, small farms, Everything about it I loved. I loved the idea of people preserving and valuing their traditions. I loved the countryside. I loved the fact that it was um, quiet, uh, that there was so much beauty there, but uh, both architecture and uh, the simple houses and gardens, etc., etc. 
Um, and it just was a wonderful place to visit. And I, of course, I got from my tra travels there the thing that I get from a lot of parts of France and from other parts of Europe, for that matter, a, a douse being immersed in a culture where the general population really cares about what they eat. And that, to me, is like having the most amazing sort of spa or something. I mean, it's just sort of reinforced. It just makes me feel better. <laughs> and I just realise that I'm not sort of a mad person, you know, too. That it really, for, for all these people, they really care, like as Frank says, they would really care about what ham they bought. And in the southwest of France, they'd certainly know about their foie gras and their duck and all their ducky bits. And, and so if you know the climate and geography of a place, does that make you understand why things are combined in the way they Yes, are? it does, definitely. And, of course, there's always more to find out. So there's always a, a little bit of extra uh, excitement if you, if you add to your what you think is quite a respectable amount of knowledge, but you go there and you find out something new. That's good. Were they good at sharing that knowledge? Yes, I think that you had to wing, I had to find the right sort of people. But um, I asked a farmer's wife to show me everything about a fattened duck, you know, from the killing of it to what they did with the blood, and then to the whole thing. And that, for me, it may not be everybody's cup of tea, and anyone who's horrified can leave now. But I just found that that was absolutely fascinating, and uh, she was proud to show me exactly what they did and how they used the tongue of the duck and the gizzards of the duck and the neck of the duck and the carcass. And that was fantastic, and I really appreciated it. Frank, your book, Ma Vida Rustica, is the result of travels to Spain in 2000. Um, tell us about that, that trip and, and how you gathered the recipes for the book. It might have been a little bit later than 2000, <laughs> but... Uh... But um, it was basically a road trip. It was Richard and myself um, over several trips over a whole year. Um, and we, you know, there were people I'd already met through previous visits, um, people that we just met by chance, people we, you know, we might have, we were in a small town, for instance, um, in you know, a place called Sierra de Francia, which nobody would ever go to. The only reason I went there years ago was, was a famous uh, Louis Buñuel movie. Uh, called Lamb, Lamb Without Bread and uh, you know, fascinated me that you know, these people lived a lot from whatever they could grow and the wild herbs they could find in, in the land and, um, and we were wanting to write a, a chapter on, on you know, the, the real love Spanish people have for little gardens just for little market gardens to just you know, grow the food for themselves um, and this seemed to be a like, perfect place. I'd been there once before. It was a you know, pristine national park with tiny little villages. Um, but in between the villages, there were these little um, farms. And this is a national park, and people would go and you know, harvest what they wanted. And you know, no one was telling them, well, you can't grow um, you know, asparagus, or you can't, you know, but, you know, because they've been doing it forever. So um, it was just a matter of walking into this town, not knowing anybody, smelling, um, you know, it seemed like leeks cooking or something really delicious cooking and walking into this little restaurant and saying, hi, how are you going? Um, there was a guy in the corner. Uh, his name was Fausto, which is a strange name for a character that um, is going to be showing you around. But uh, he, um, he grabbed us by the scruff of the neck, said... Are you guys the Swedish journalists? No, we're the Spanish, uh, we're the Australian chefs. He'd for some reason been expecting some journalist from Sweden. Uh, he was actually a, um, a professor in the local Salamanca University on, um, on viticulture, and it just happened that he knew everything about, um, you know, the market gardens and um, the uh, the wild herbs and wild food of that area, and he just. He spent two or three days showing us around. He was mad. He was yeah, completely crazy. But, uh, but um, yeah, it's just by chance and those sort of things. And, you know, on other occasions there was, you know, a, a, a food producer that we'd been introduced to that, again, would just be so generous with their time um, and show us absolutely everything about what they did but also what their neighbour did, you know, what... Um, the, the favourite little restaurant down the road did and, and there's those introductions and, and just the openness of how people are when when you're talking about food and you show a real interest, like you're saying, the culture just opens up because people are just so happy to explain to you about what they do and why they do it. 
Elizabeth, you begin your cookbook, The First Happiness, with a quote by the Chinese writer Lin Yutang, and this is it. The appreciation of good food, like the appreciation of good music, is an unmistakable sign of culture. And, and I was also interested reading um, your book about uh, the way you talk about the philosophy of, of, of eating in China and uh, Confucius saying food is the first happiness. That's right, that's right, Romano. Well, it's just something I feel that the, perhaps the Chinese and the Europeans, perhaps the Italians a little bit more, have got this open-hearted approach to eating. You know, there's, it's just the most beautiful, natural thing in the world to talk about food, to extol it or to to um, damn it if you don't like it but you know it, it's a very important part of everyday living and I've lived that all my life at home in Melbourne because I grew up in, in a very Chinese home my mother never learned to speak English for all the many years she came out here as a young bride of 20 something and died at the age of 91 and we had to speak Chinese to her all the time and and she was always giving us words of wisdom certainly not looked learned from books because she was just a farmer's daughter Daughter, but she had this wisdom, and a lot of it was to do with food, and uh, and, and and somehow I thought that I was a little bit, you know cut off from from what the real culture was and then when I went back to China actually the most vivid memory was when I went back with my mother in 1976 I think it was and my daughter who I see sitting down here too um, the three generations of us went back and of course it was many years my mother was about 18 or 19 when she left and she's now 76 and we went back to her China back to the village and I remember vividly the very first meal that the villagers put on for us and they were very poor folk and it was a special occasion so they all put in their best and it was exactly the food that my mother had cooked for me all my life at home in Melbourne and I thought wow this is really what I've grown up with and, and here it is you know so far away from from me and yet it brought home to me very much my background and so it was sort of touching base in a very it was a heartfelt way, very humbling way. But of course, not all my travels are Asia. I love discovering food in all of all of uh, Europe, and I love French and, and Italian food, and I love Spanish. I went to Spain for a food tour as well, so I'm a little bit of an obsessive foodie. Um, but Asia, of course, China, and now I take groups into Vietnam as well as China, and I, I, I just sort of have this emotional emotional attachment to the people and therefore to the food. You mentioned your, your mother, but of course your father had a very big influence on you <laughs> and your cooking. And I was amazed to, to learn about uh, his role in, in translating Chinese food to a, an Australian audience. Well, what did he invent? Well, Chinese, Tell us what Chinese he invented. Chinese food has a, a brilliant way of doing that. <laughs> it can go anywhere and it can make really good Chinese food out of, I mean, if I went to Germany, I could make... Um, a Chinese dish out of sauerkraut, I guess, and, and uh, sausages, you know, I could make a Chinese. <laughs> and my dad had that, that entrepreneurial spirit, and he knew that Aussies love the little dim sim, you know, in the, in the local cafes. And he said, this should go right out to all the people. So he opened up a factory. I think the factory consisted of my mum and two aunties for a start, and they handmade the dim sims. And then a few years later, quite a few years later, I think he um, managed to get an engineer who created a machine to make them. And now I, I don't know how to quote but I, the, the statistics, but I believe that millions are eaten every week in Victoria. And so that's his legacy and uh, quite a few other legacies uh, that he left behind. But I like to think that perhaps I'm still waving the flag for him and doing my thing. Well, Frank, you mentioned your father, but Stephanie, you say that you're, in your early food life you were influenced by one Mary Burchett. Tell me about her. Well, my mother was an exceptional cook. She was, she was a good cook as far as the quality of the food that came out every night on the plate, but she also was different in the sense that she really cared about understanding where it had come from. This was extraordinarily unusual in 1950s Australia. 
to have somebody who really cared about the heritage of a dish and went to some effort to find out how it was original. And this is a woman who, at this stage, had never travelled to Europe. She had done a little, she had travelled to Japan as a student, but other than that, she had just grown up in Adelaide, actually, and then when, after her marriage came to Melbourne. So she really put effort and time into reading, thinking, and have, doing her best with ingredients which weren't fabulous in those days. But always when we, the evening meal was served, she would make, not a speech, but she would definitely make a statement about what she was serving and why such and such what might be of interest to us all. So I grew up sort of understanding that there was a story in practically everything that we ate and that almost every night, I would say, some part of that meal had been produced by my mother or my grandfather. It was either grown or it was a product from a cow or a chicken or a duck. So that I also grew up assuming that that was how people lived. And because I went to a very small country school, it wasn't until I moved to a bigger world, Melbourne University, that I realised that this was not how every other Australian teenager was living. It was a big shock. <laughs> Well, when we travel, it's not just um, the foods that we come across, but it's also the way they're presented, the way they're eaten, table manners as, as well, I suppose. And um, how does the way we eat food and the rules around eating food um, affect our experience of it? Um, and that's the sort of the question I wanted to ask of you now. I, I, uh, this was prompted by Elizabeth. You, you, uh, in you write, you're writing about be, it being rude to leave rice in a bowl. Yes. Tell us yes. about some of the rules about eating Chinese yes, food. Yes, I guess over the many, many thousands of years of, of China's long history, that rice has sustained their the millions and so there is this almost a um, a sacredness about rice even if it's not even if, if there's plenty there you still don't waste it because in in the early days i think most of well 80 percent of chinese people were on the land and they were rice farmers and particularly i think in my mother's case because they lived in south china and um yes you, you could leave all the fancy foods that's all right because that shows that you're not a um well, what as I say, a, a person who needs a, um, a lot of indulgence. You know, that's all right, you're a simple person, but if you leave rice, that shows no respect for the real values in life. Because I, I guess each grain of rice was almost talked about as being the, the sweat of man's brow. And uh, there used to be a story my mother would say to us, um, to us girls, now if you don't eat up every grain of rice in that bowl, you'll grow up and you'll marry a pockmarked man. Because the grains of rice represent presented the smallpox marks and they must have been very prevalent in her day and so we used to just eat but I don't think we need much encouragement to eat our rice I think almost every Chinese person can't imagine a good meal without a good bowl or two of, or more of rice so even when we say um, dinner's ready we say Lesikfana which translates as come and eat your rice and it just means that rice is food in every sense yeah, and so, yeah, that's 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 where we start. And I suppose um, when I used to bring my girlfriends home from school, they go, "Oh wow, roast duck! Oh wow, you know, the crayfish or whatever." And my mother would frown because they were eating that and not eating their rice as well, you know. And then uh, my brothers had a hard time bringing home Australian girlfriends if they didn't <laughs> if they didn't conform to Chinese table manners. They were out. <laughs> Was that the only one that they needed to know? Were there others? Pardon? Were there other other rules about table manners? Oh, lots of other rules. Um, you don't eat, you don't go to the same dish. You know how Chinese meals are multi multi course meals. There may be three or four or five or six different dishes on the table. The only individual um, food is your rice bowl, and you take a little bit of this and some rice, a little bit of that and some rice. And if you go, just because you happen to like roast duck, you don't eat roast duck twice before you eat rice again. You'll have to have a vegetable or something. And um, the mother notices these things very, very easily. And <laughs> the other end of the chopsticks comes down rather hard on you when you're, <laughs> when you're reaching out once too often to, to a favourite favorite dish, you know. And the same rules, I think, in English eating. You eat closest, you pick the, the morsel closest to you. You don't touch anybody else's 
piece. If once it's touched, it's yours. And um, but we don't have the table manners, you know, like the Emily Post manners about how you sit or how you 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 drink your soup with a spoon out that way. We don't have those sort of manners. But it's the way you treat the food. You have to respect the food. And I think that's the important thing in the table manners. Father always starts first. He, he picks up his chopsticks first. And then, and, you know, there's respect for older people always at the Chinese table, always. What about the, the, the Spanish method? Because, we're, you know, tapas, we're, we're talking about small dishes yeah. being shared as well. Are there rules? Um, I guess if you're talking tapas and, yeah, that culture, that phenomenon of, you know, social eating and you pretty much leave your manners at the door. Well, if anyone's ever been to Spain, <laughs> you know, there's, there's pretty much, you know, it's you fend for yourself, you know, you, you're climbing over people and, <laughs> yeah, and you pass things over. And I think that's a Spanish sort of, you know, culture. It's a very intense, um, you know, social, fun um, experience and that yeah the, the street experience is, is very intense in Spain and, and that's one of the reasons I love it so much is because it's you know it's it, there isn't that you know um, there's manners you know there's people will always say um, to complete strangers you know people will talk who's the last in line you know how are you going today and there's you know that conversation always happens but when it comes to eating it's like just get your own and um, as hurry up. But but even even with rice, I mean, it, you know, I was thinking, like, when, you know, I live in a obviously a very Spanish Australian culture combination, and I remember, you know, when Mum would make the paella, for instance, you know, she'd make the whole paella, have all the all the sauce made, and she wouldn't put the rice in until she knew 20 minutes beforehand that we we're all going to come home. So, you know, I'd be playing cricket in the street, and she'd you know, yell out, come on, Frank, time for payer. You knew 20 minutes time, you had to be at the table. And the other thing with payer is really strange is that you actually don't eat it from a plate. Like, you have this big payer in the middle, and you just eat your way in with a spoon. <laughs> it's like a pizza. You've got to stick to your little triangle, and just keep going and going and going, and don't ever go into someone else's territory. But just a little this bit. is all unspoken, or you just train no, this is, for this? This is the way it's done. This yeah, but you, done. but you, you know, what happens if you've got between the kids and what, what was going oh, you, on? You're trying to sneak an extra prawn. <laughs> oh, well, you know, the forks have been known to fly. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Stephanie, it's a different it's a different kettle of fish, isn't it? In France, in France, it's definitely there's a formality, no matter how simple the meal, and I um, have always noticed that. So that the tables are always set. There's always an underplate. There's always a procession of dishes. Um, the, very rarely would in France would you have a just one dish for a meal. You would always have a little something and then a little something else, usually a salad and then probably fruit. And I rather like that sort of formal progression of things. I also like the fact that if you're having soup in a small restaurant or in a family, it would always come to the table in a soup tureen and it would be ladled into your bowl so that usually somebody else, probably the woman who's hosting the evening or the waiter, if it's a restaurant, would do this. You wouldn't do it for yourself. Um, and, but then there would be, you know, the braise of something or other would be put on the table with serving cutlery for you to help yourself. And... Um, so that's just a Did different way. Did you find way it nerve-wracking at all when you first no, began no, no. to do it? No, Well, I don't. I actually quite like that sense of ceremony without it being off-putting. You know, in the sense, it's a bit what Elizabeth is saying. It is the food, it has respect, and it's important. It's put on the table. This is a beautiful something or other. We hope you're going to enjoy it. I think that um, uh, something both Stephanie and Frank have noticed in, in France and Spain, respectively, is um, that the young people have moved out of the villages, these villages that you mm. like to hang out in. Um, uh, could you talk a bit about uh, what effect that has on, on the things that are cooked and, and the way they're cooked? And then may maybe Elizabeth could think about this too. Stephanie? Well, I certainly know that in French villages what is happening, which is sad is that because the population, because people, young people move away because there isn't any work, you have things like once upon a time, any village you went to in France of whatever size would have a baker. That would just take for granted there would be a baker. There are now villages where there are no bakers, where there isn't a butcher, where people have to travel quite a long way, probably to a dreadful hypermarché. 
to go and do their shopping because there simply isn't the the young people, the, the business in the, in the small villages. I don't like to see that, but I have to admit that is the reality. Um, deep in the Dordogne, you still have lovely villages that are vibrant with, country, with markets once a week or twice a week even. Um, but I do know that as you drive through the countryside, you can drive through villages that have looked, seem to be pretty much deserted. They, they used to have ovens, didn't they? Communal ovens that you came and... Yes. seen those for a while, but um, certainly you don't see very many young people. And then in a town of any considerable size in France now, you will almost certainly see breaded, you know, franchise food, takeaway places that we're not going to mention. <laughs> <laughs> what about, Frank, what's your experience? Um, well, my most direct experience, I guess, is we were living in a, in a small village right in the in the Pyrenees, right near the French border, Corbiescas, and uh, pretty beautiful area. It has, um, yeah, in winter time becomes, you know, close to the the slopes, and summertime it's just a mecca for um, for walkers. And uh, myself and my partner Vanessa were working in a the kitchen there, um, and it was a beautiful place. Uh, and this this particular town was. You know, stunning and you know, well looked after, and um, it had everything going for it. Then there'd be, you know, you'd, you'd go for walks to other towns, and they'd be totally deserted, like completely deserted. Like you could just go in there and, and start a house. And, but there was even some towns where they'd been rejuvenated by like almost hippie communes. Um, where people would come in and, and start their own little commune and start growing food. So, I mean, it's, it's very, you know, the, these are, you know, obviously more the exception than the norm, but there definitely has been a, a move of urbanisation, like every country. I mean, and it's, you know, it's, it's part of, you know, people trying to find a, a more, um, yeah, an easy way of living. I mean, obviously, we, you, you know, it's, it's very romantic to think about living in a, um, a small town, but obviously, you know, if you're going hungry, then and your children aren't being fed and, and uh, you know, you're going to try and find a better way of living. So I think that is a natural progression, but it's good to see that, you know, there's still some places that have a reason for being there, whether it be the fact that they're a centre for for um, winter tourism or summer walking tours and, and they still have that, you know, that essence to them as well. Elizabeth, I mean, urbanisation is a massive I'm movement think, in yes. China. Yes, I'm, I'm thinking about China particularly uh, when I, because Hong Kong is another story again, even though it's part of China now. But I think in China, of course, there is this push for urbanisation, as Frank has said, and of course we won't mention those big places also that the young people flock to. They're almost a reward for children doing well at school to have a night out at one of these these places. But <laughs> I think that the Chinese particularly perhaps have got such a deep, deep tradition and it, that, that food has big stronghold, you know, on their hearts and their stomachs that if all else passes, I think the love of the, their own food does remain. And I talk to a lot of young people when I travel and a lot of them can't cook at all, no. but they they go back to mum or mum goes over to their house every night and cooks for them. I don't know what's going to happen with another generation or so, um, but I, I they still eat the food of a long, long time back. You know, that, that's not changed. I had um, some wonderful family meals in, in Hangzhou and I think in, um, in Shanghai and in Beijing when I went to a, a home, a typical home, and the young people there, they, they, was, they were certainly the generation after me, they cooked the meal, and it was exactly the same as my grandmother and my mother cooked. I didn't see any change at all in the recipes. It was very, very old and the same. But I, I don't know about the, the coming generations. I, I think that, they, that that leaves a big question mark as to how they will be able to retain their culinary heritage. And uh, I just pray that uh, somehow or another it uh, it has to survive, because it's, um, it's such a deep part of the the, the whole culture, isn't it? Yes. Um, the idea of being open to everything and open to new new ideas and, and, and uh, going to to these places and learning. But um, James Michener said, if you reject the food, ignore the customs, fear the religion, and avoid the people, you may you might better stay at home. Mm. But but are there some meals that you've you've struggled to to eat? I mean, is it, was, would there be things that you wouldn't eat? If someone had cooked it for you? 
Um, you mean the dishes or just yeah. the, the techno? The, oh, well, I was unfamiliar with a couple of the dishes in my village the first time I went back, <laughs> right back in deep, deep village cooking. I think one of them might have been a kind of um, a, a possum type of thing because I could see the tail in the, in the dish <laughs> and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't. And then there was something else from, a, from the river and I think that looked a little bit too, too snake-like for me. <laughs> But on the whole, I'm pretty open. I'm pretty open to to foods of any any cuisine. I I have very little tolerance, as my friends know, for people who say, "Oh, I don't like peas," for instance. And I'm thinking, what is so? In, what is so? I mean, how innocuous can a pea be? You know, and yet <laughs> that sort I think of thing. They were I'm frightened by of, a pea of. as a child. <laughs> so we, as as Chinese children, we're we're taught that all food is is um, to be respected, and uh, so long as it is fresh, I think one should be able to have a go. Yeah, Stephanie, even though it's different. Stephanie, what about you? Is there anything that you would draw the line at? Well, I've tried most things. Um, I must say, one of the flavours that I don't really like is that flavour in the preserved egg, the so-called thousand-year-old okay. egg. Yes. But it's just a—it's—it's a, it's not a texture thing; it's the flavour, whatever it is. But there's practically nothing I don't enjoy in its own environment. Um, I remember eating Andriette sausage, which is one of those things that divides people when they go to France because it is rolled up intestines and inside a, a casing and it's quite strong. Um, I don't think that's my favourite food, but I'm certainly perfectly able to eat it and would, would eat it if it was served at a, at a meal. I'm not saying that would be with the first choice if I went to the charcuterie to buy it. What about you, Frank? Uh, I'm pretty much the same. There's, there's pretty much nothing I've, that really scares me to, to eat. Um, I probably haven't had some of the experiences that you've had um, <laughs> of um, tales and things, but uh, there's some things that I thought I wouldn't eat. There was like a you know, dish recently which was um, chicken blood, and I would have thought, no, I can't try that, but... It was absolutely delicious, and uh, you know, kidneys were one of the things I, I, I used to really repulse me until I've eaten, I ate them done properly. And then, mm. you know, it's a lot of those things. You know, once you actually have someone that knows how to cook it, mm. and you eat it, then it changes your perception. Well, you're you're all very brave because you take culinary tours. You take strangers with you overseas, large groups of them. I want to investigate some of these experiences. Um, Stephanie, what about you? I mean, how, how have you experienced I've this? never travelled with them. No, you've never travelled with them. <laughs> we meet. You, oh, we you meet. meet them. <laughs> in, uh, either. What happens? What's well, so they, you know, the people uh, weave this experience into their travel experience, their broader travel experience. I don't think I'll ever do it again. Because well, what happened? <laughs> we want to hear. We want to hear the details. Oh, well, it was lovely. The people were delightful, and we had a very good time. And Maggie and I were in Tuscany, and we were there. This is Maggie for, Beer. Yes, for five weeks with three different groups of people resident in a very large house and we had a fantastic time but it was absolutely draining because it was every day full on in for 12 people and they all wanted every bit of you and we wanted to give it but we did find it very exhausting so that was a fantastic experience never to be repeated often <laughs> Often people ask, but say, no, that was then, that was once, not again. And then I did it twice in France, in the Perigord. And again, the students or friends just came to the, the house. And we had a great time too. But again, it is, I just find, maybe it's just me, but it is very, very draining and it, you have to give everything to those people because they are paying a lot of money usually, not necessarily to me, but you know. Um, and you want them to have an absolutely marvellous experience, but it is very draining at the end of it, I find. Frank, what about you? Um, I've only done it once, and uh, I, I do agree it is incredibly draining. Um, we what did, did you a, do? How did you do it? Well, we, we went. It was a ten-day tour, and it was pretty much whistle-stop. You know, moving quite a bit. It was almost 
following the footsteps of Mavita Rustica and and we we, you know, we we met some of the same characters. We, for instance, we went and saw Fausto in uh, in the Chiro Mad Fausto. Yeah, and um, he lived up to his reputation. There's no what doubt about that. What did he do? That. What was the maddest thing he did? The maddest thing is he just takes control of the bus. So he'll just you know he takes control of the whole tour and um, demands that you go here and demands that you go there and uh, and the, the whole you know, schedule that you know, these things run on goes out the window. So, you know, when you're meant to be having lunch at, you know, three o'clock, which is very normal sort of time in Spain, ends up being five o'clock and, you know, and just so, so things can go a little bit haywire. But um, I actually found it really enjoyable. It was, um, you know, an opportunity to go back and actually um, meet some people that I'd you know, spent time with and may not have an opportunity to go back and meet again. Um, also, spend time with people that really enjoyed food um, and were there to actually, you know, learn. The only thing I'd say it was such it was kind of like almost a chef's tour in the fact that we we visited a, a lot of producers and you know cheese makers, wine makers, and hamon makers and charcuterie makers and all these people. And even though I loved it, I could see that yeah, you know, in the face that enough's enough, and I want to go to another factory that <laughs> makes this. So is that a once and only experience for you? No, we're doing it again this year. This year we're going to go to um, Barcelona. So as I was saying before, we'd written, I've wrote, written a book on um, a food guide to Barcelona. Uh, so we'll spend three or four days there and take some day trips. And then we're going to an incredible region of Spain called the Priorat, which is one of the finest winemaking regions of Spain. It's, you know, it's totally you know, beautiful small towns, very isolated, um, great wineries. And uh, from there, we'll go and do some day tours to different parts. Now, Elizabeth, you're, you're, oh. you're a veteran of these Oh, absolutely. I, I was just listening, and I think I must be a bit an odd bod because I just love doing them. <laughs> I've, I've done them for 45 years, <laughs> and I've lost How count. How do you organise them? What, what happens on yours? I just organise every step of the way what I want them to do, and I just love sharing everything with them. They're usually people who are, you know, they, they enjoy food and they, they, they feel very much bonded with me for a start if not directly maybe their sister or their mother or their, you know that sort of thing so there is a connection usually with the people who take my tours and um, I feel absolutely fantastic all the time with them only once I think in those 45 years I had one lady who was very very timid that was all but the rest of them are out there to uh, enjoy and share all, all the great fun and the food and I come back better than before I left and uh, so I, I've got one I think I'm going to Vietnam in uh, um, October the 8th and then China next spring in April and I can't wait to take them, they just love it and I love, I love taking How them many people I take from 15, about 15 people that's, that's a good number I can look at 15 people all at once, actually, and uh, and I can relate to each one of them. And, um, you know, you get the odd sniffle or the odd cold or something, but I haven't had any dramas. And, yeah, uh, what about fighting? What about fighting between them? There's always one person no. who's a bit annoying. Isn't there? Well, I, I think... <laughs> There's always one person that enjoys a drink I, way I too much you, and you can control that person. You have, to, you have to sort of right from the start say, well, look, um, I'm, I'm the, the linchpin sort of thing, you know, and everybody works around me. So they, they, feel, they feel that. And um, I sit in the front of the bus. Nobody's allowed to sit in the front of the bus. <laughs> and, and they know. So nobody fights. Nobody, nobody does anything naughty because um, I'm, I'm mum. Popsticks. I'm the mother. Popsticks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, they, 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 I, I can't think of anything. And this, last, the, this, this year, you know, I had a very big birthday, Ramona. Huge birthday. <laughs> yeah, really big. <laughs> And so many of those people have been on tours with me going back years. They got together and they've, I've had five parties by these people who've travelled with me, you know, to celebrate my birthday. And it's really such a tribute and I just feel so so humble, you know, really, that they've loved China, they've loved Vietnam and they've loved it with me. And what can I say? I must be a bit of a freak, I don't know. Yeah, but, uh, it's clearly because you're gorgeous and lovely and warm and, and sharing with them. <laughs> it's a long time, isn't it? 45 years. I can't count how many tours I've um, done. And I'm still going, And even though I've had a big birthday. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we've talked about your cookbooks, but let's talk about other people's cookbooks because I'd love to know um, what we might discover on your bookshelves if um, if we took a little tour of, of, of yours, Stephanie. Who, whose cookbooks do you have and do you love? 
Well, I've said many times that I do love the work of Elizabeth David and I have continued to love her books since I was about 20. Um, there's a lot, I have a wall of cookbooks and so there's many, many. I brought in this one, this La Mazie, which is a, a book that is such a lovely little book on everything, everything to do with southwest France. And um, it is amazing when you read something like this and then you read 20, this is written in French, and then I read 20 English writers on that region and you realise, you, you recognise the paragraphs, you know, it's just amazing. She is the authority and she hasn't left a stone unturned or a mushroom not commented on or, <laughs> or a gadget in the kitchen to help you take the inner skin off a chestnut and so it goes on. And, and it's think, not that big, that book. It's a little facsimile edition, so it's sort of... It's quite small print, I suppose. But... It's, was a, it's a little treasure, yeah. and so that's, that's something I do love. But look, I, I read cookbooks a lot. Um, I don't know, I don't know what else to say that I like the work of Alice Waters. I, I mean, there's obviously all our local chefs, like Frank, I have all their books and enjoy them very much. What about someone like MFK Fisher who wrote about wrote about? I have ambivalence about MFK Fisher. I th always feel that she had her mouth so full of words that they sometimes I feel that it's a bit too florid, her paragraphs, but I have read a lot of her and she does say some lovely things and she has written very beautifully about France. Mm. Elizabeth, do you, do you have cookbooks? Yeah, yes, I do. Um, I've got walls and walls of cookbooks, like Stephanie. I, I read and read them, but I don't think I've cooked more than perhaps two or three out of each book. Not all of the books. Stephanie's is one book I, I definitely have to. Every time I'm feeling a little bit nervous about something, I'll go to that book. I've even actually rung her a couple of times to see what to do when I want to do something quite different from my own cooking. When I think of Chinese books, I like the books that have got a little bit more philosophy in them rather than just recipes. And uh, Lin Yu Tang has one that's called, I think it's the, the Art of Chinese Cooking. I like what he writes about food. And there's another one called from Bu Wei Chang, and it's uh, the... Um, uh, I think it's the, the Joy of Chinese Cooking. I think it's a little bit different from the other one, but they, they just got lovely things to say and I, that tickles me a little bit, but not so much for the actual recipes. And I think as, like, nearly all the local chefs in Melbourne, I, I do have their books and just like to, to know that they're there. <laughs> yeah. And Frank, when you go to Spain, you come back with cookbooks. I try to. I try and come back with you know, at least one from every little town. I mean, the funny thing is that so many little cookbooks get produced in very small quantities and you only find them, you know, very much in, in that situation, its place. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm lucky enough to be able to read Spanish. So, I, and, and a lot of these books, I mean, they don't really relate to the food of the day. They're probably pretty much the food of you know, years and years ago and uh, but you still get such a, you know, it's fascinating to see the combination of flavours, how the food's developed um, What have you got you know, there? Uh, this one's one on um, traditional cooking in Cordoba, which is where my family's from, um, you know, and it's got dishes where they've got, you know, salt, cod and orange and uh, uh, sausage and pomegranate and, you know, it has that real um, Middle Eastern sort of influence, much more stark than the actual food of Cordoba actually is. Um, and then there's other books, you know, like, um, you know, Simon Hopkins, I think, when I've, yeah, you know a good cookbook when it's so filthy, yeah, yeah. because <laughs> you know it works and it's, and it's got such, you know, it's well written. What's that one then? Uh, this one here, or roast chicken and other stories. Roast chicken and other stories. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's probably book. is a magnificent book, and that was one of the first books I bought when I first wanted to cook. Um, I've got to say though, that there is like you know, being a chef, it's different sort of to being, I guess, a home cook and and doing it for the love of it. I mean, there's there's almost a, um, you know some of the, I some chefs books are great, but then there's some that are just. I just find them a bit sort of obnoxious in a way, like the way, you know, there's, there's books like White Heat and, and stuff that just romanticise the, the whole kitchen sort of thing rather than just about, you know, cooking nice food. Mm. 